This is going to be Galatians chapter 6, and I want to talk about doing good to other Christians. I believe you're supposed to be good to every person, but how much more to those who are in the household of faith, those people that are part of the body of Christ with you. Look at Galatians 6.10. It says, As we therefore... As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So the first thing I want to talk about is make sure you restore one another. In Galatians 6, 1, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So we are all sinners, and sometimes some of us are overtaken in a fault. You know, if somebody, a Christian, can think they're in control of a particular sin, and they continue doing it, and now it's overtaken them. Most times that person is going to get back in fellowship with the Lord eventually, and when they do, you have a whole bunch of Christians that just don't want anything to do with that person anymore because of what they did. And that's actually not being spiritual. You may think you're being spiritual by rejecting somebody because of something they've done, but you're messing up when you don't restore the person back into fellowship with you. And you go around teaching that God will forgive anybody for anything, and you say that person can still fellowship with God after they've committed a horrible sin, yet you make yourself too good to have anything to do with them or to fellowship with them. And that shows that you think you're more righteous than God anyway because if God can still fellowship with that person when he's done wrong in the past, then why can't you still fellowship with that person who's done wrong in the past? So in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted." So you need to consider yourself. You also might be tempted yourself. Jesus was tempted. So you will face temptation. Jesus Christ is the only man who never gave into temptation. So who is to say that you're not going to give into temptation the next time the opportunity presents itself? Many times you uh, don't realize how evil you are until the opportunity presents itself. And you go ahead and go through with that evil thing you've always wanted to do in your mind. You just haven't done it yet because the opportunity hasn't presented itself. Think about it, you men that's lusted after men, women your whole life, and then the opportunity presents itself for you, for you to commit adultery, and you go through with it. You never thought that you would, but wicked thoughts always lead to wicked things. The, the people who don't get restored back into fellowship are the ones who have a sin... That was out in the open where everybody knew about it most times. That's why that they don't get put back in fellowship. It's because they've got this big sin that they had in their past. Everybody knew about it. So all the Christians think, well, if I get back in fellowship with that person, what's everybody going to think about me? But really, the only difference between them and you is by God's grace, nobody knew about those sins you were committing in secret. You probably did the same things or worse. Yet... You forget about your own problems. So if a man is overtaken in a fault, not even necessarily a sin, you should restore him when he gets right. Next thing, bear burdens. In Galatians 6, 2, it says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Jesus Christ bear our burdens. He became sin for us who knew no sin. In Isaiah 53, 4, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. My pastor always says, if you get around a whole bunch of Christians, then most likely one of them is good enough right with the Lord to where he can get a prayer through for your burden. You know, if you get around a whole bunch of other Christians that can pray for you, one of them will eventually get through with their prayer. Even if all you can do is pray about another person's problem, then that is bearing the burden because you will be burdened for them in prayer. Even if all you can do is listen to them talk about their burden, you're still bearing their burden for them. So, the first thing, restore one another. The next thing, bear one another's burdens. And the next thing, don't think you're better than other Christians. In Galatians 6.3, 
It says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. If you think that you are anything of yourself, then you have greatly deceived yourself. If you think you're better than another Christian, then you are actually focused on the flesh. Your whole focus is on your flesh and other people's flesh all the time. You know why? Because spiritually speaking, and when it comes to our standing in Christ, we are all equal. I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ on my record, and you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your record if you're saved. My record just can't get any better, and your record can't get any better. It's already perfect in Christ, and it can't get worse because Christ will never do any wrong. There'll never be anything bad on our records ever again when it comes to eternity, when it comes to our salvation. And if you realize that, then you realize all Christians are equal. The only way you could be better than another Christian is through the works of the flesh. And if you think you're better than other Christians, then you have began to focus on the flesh. Because that's the only way you can be better is through the, the works of the flesh. In 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend ourselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You just need to do what you know to be right. Don't do something to outdo another Christian. That's not being good to your brother. When you go around focused on the flesh, focused on all the things you're doing in the flesh and trying to make your your fleshly works outdo another person's fleshly works, that's not being spiritual. Galatians 6, 4 says, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. But skip down a few verses and look at verse 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. So they desire to make a fair show in the flesh, and they want to glory in your flesh. You see, men were going around trying to get the Bible believers circumcised so that they could glory in their flesh. They could say, look, Paul, I got one of your boys to get circumcised. He's not part of your group now. He de he's not part of that uh, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ crowd anymore. He, he, he knows he's got to be circumcised and believe. And I've heard uh, of Campbellites going into Baptist churches as imposters, and they lead parts of congregations away and deceive them into believing baptism saves. They do this that they can glory in that person's flesh, so they can say, "Look, Baptist uh, preacher, uh, I made it. I made your boy here. He don't just believe believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation anymore. He believes." get water baptized and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He believes, repent, believe, confess, be baptized to be saved now. With these people, it's more about the outward things that they assume makes them right with the Lord. They're focused on the flesh. So they walk around like they are more spiritual and more holy because they think they're doing more stuff in the flesh. They think yeah, their fleshly works outweighs everything. But what did Paul say? They deceive themselves. And that's not treating other Christians right when you go around focused on your own fleshly works and thinking you're more spiritual. You think yourself to be something when you're nothing. Those guys are going around saying circumcision in faith or baptism in faith are required for salvation. And they're not keeping the law more than anybody else. Yet they said you had to believe and keep the law to be saved. In Acts 15.1 it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Look at what that what they're saying there. In Acts 15, 5, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So you didn't just believe. You had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses according to them. But those guys weren't keeping the law at all. Because in James 2.10 it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So if you, you keep the law in all aspects, and then you mess up in one way, you just, you're just you guilty of all of it. It can't save you. only thing it can do is show you that you need a Savior. In Galatians 6.13 it says, For neither they themselves 
who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Even the ones who are circumcised aren't keeping the law. With religious people, it's all about a show in the flesh. They wore long robes, made long prayers, fasted. They disfigured their faces so that men would know that they're fasting. They had those scriptures on their foreheads. It was all a show in the flesh. They loved the chief seats. And a lot of times Christians just want the glory in the flesh. If you listen to a lot of these evangelists, there's just absolutely no Bible being preached at all. He just bra literally, he brags on himself directly and indirectly the entire time. It doesn't take, it doesn't, it doesn't make people love the Bible listening to that. That's the problem. All he does is he, he brags on himself so he makes people love preaching that doesn't include the Bible and makes people just have preachers as their idols. So he gets young men who follow him and do the same thing so that he looks prestigious. He looks like a macho man when he's behind the pulpit just bragging about how manly he is and how ungodly and sissy-like everybody else is. And you know what I like about preachers like men like Harry Nix? He never brags on himself. Guys like that, he, ne he, he never brags on anything except for the cross and the blood and the Bible and the Savior. And you can just feel the humbleness in his preaching. And it, he just makes much of Jesus. Preachers like that, that's, who, who, that's what I like to listen to. I don't like to hear this macho, I'm a big macho man bragging. All they are is a big ball of flesh. And Paul was like you, real humble. He, he didn't look good. He didn't use great words and fair speeches. He said in Galatians six fourteen, he said, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Why glory in the flesh? If you don't glory in the flesh, then you're not going to think that you're so much better than all the other Christians around you. You're glorying in the cross, and what does the cross remind you of? It reminds you that you have sinned against God and that you need a Savior. No wonder Paul said things like, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he said, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am that I'm not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. In Ephesians 3, 8, he said, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. In 1 Timothy 1, 15, he said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So Paul knew he was a sinner. He said, that I, he said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul makes much of Jesus Christ and makes little of himself. He was little in his own sight. And don't think yourself to be something when you're nothing, because when you do, you'll deceive yourself. I'm ashamed of my flesh, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul says in Galatians 6, 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. You see, that outward junk like circumcision and uncircumcision has nothing to do with being a new creature in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 18, it says, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And it ain't the flesh that's new. The all things that are become new have to do with your inner man. The flesh ain't new. It still wants to do the same wicked stuff it always did. It won't profit you nothing. Get your eyes off the flesh and you'll quit thinking that you're something special. So, don't think you're better than other Christians. You're just deceiving yourself. And next thing, the next thing is, this is going to seem like something that a lot of people think you don't do with other Christians. They think, well, this is being mean, but actually this is being good. And it's, it's tough love. It says in Galatians 6, 5, For every man shall bear his own burden. 
You see, you can bear someone's burden so much that you cause them to forget how to bear their own burden. Paul said, for every man shall bear his own burden. Did you know that you can help someone to a fault? You can help them so much that it's to a fault. You hear testimony after testimony from drug addicts and alcoholics who say, never give money to a drug addict. Never help a drug addict. Never, They say never help them too much because they get to a point where they are so given over to their addiction that they won't stop unless they hit the bottom face first. Face plant the concrete. They won't stop. And if you keep giving them money to buy drugs, if you keep giving them a place to live and pampering them like a child, then they will never grow up. Their mind will be stuck like a teenager. They will leech off you until you die. You will be miserable and your life will be not pleasing to God because you're not helping that person. You're under this illusion by the devil. He is telling you that to be a good person, you have to, to, to support somebody while they are in their sinful habit. But you don't have to give them money. If you don't give them money, food, and a place to live while they struggle because of their drugs and whatever their addiction is, then the devil says, well, what kind of Christian are you? Aren't you going to help this person? He's going to say, I thought Christians were supposed to help people. But there comes a point where helping someone actually hurts someone. You might temporarily get their belly full. You might temporarily give them a place to live. You might temporarily keep them off the street. But what happens when you're gone? They never learn to bear their own burden and truly face the consequences for their horrible decisions that they've made. I've faced this a lot in my life, seeing this play out a lot, where somebody would pull the Christian card on me for not continuously feeding in to someone's nonsense and helping people that are basically just taking advantage of your kindness. They say, well, I thought you were supposed to be a Christian. I, aren't Christians supposed to give me money if I need it and give me a place to live and food to eat and clothes on my back? When I see a man who can walk all over town for hours in the hot sun asking people for money, then that tells me that person is able to work. It's hard to walk around in the hot sun all day long and then squat down on your knees in 90 degree weather holding a sign that says give me food i mean i'm not saying that every person who does that is capable of working but most of them are if they can do that then they can get up at four o'clock in the morning and get to work just like me and you and if i just keep handing them 20s every time i pull out of walmart then that gives them a week's worth of meals at taco bell on the dollar menu and then the next person gives them something and then the next person gives them something. You're keeping the guy up and he's never going to learn that he can't keep leeching off people his entire life. He's going to have to bear his own burden. And some people think there is a contradiction because Paul said, bear ye one another's burdens. But then he says, for every man shall bear his own burden. But this is because you have people who will let you keep them up their whole life. They, will, they have no ambition and they will mooch off you until you have as little as they have. So if you don't give to the addict so that he can continue in his destruction of his life and everyone else's, that will guilt trip you. And this is the manipulation coming into play that I've been telling you about. They will say, don't you love your family? They will say, I thought you were a Christian. Why won't you do this? I thought you loved people. That's manipulation. Or how about this one? They will also use fear. They'll say, you better watch out not give in to that person. You may be in the same shoes as they are one day. Well, that goes back to verse 1. You restore each other in the spirit of meekness. But that isn't until the person gets right. And they aren't going to get right when you continue to feed their face and feed their habit. I have never had the temptation with drugs, but who is to say that I won't hurt myself and get prescribed some type of medication in the future and then I become an addict? That could easily happen. But would I want someone to keep me up in my habit or show me tough love, tough love to snap me out of the habit? When they say that could be you or that could be your kids, of course it could. But how does that justify me keeping someone up so that they can continue on in their addiction? Or how about this one? They flatter themselves are the one who is keeping the person up. They say things like, He loves his son so much that he continues to keep him up, even though 
all the bad things he's currently doing. He's still keeping his son up. He's such a good selfless person. But he's leading the the enabler, the one keeping the drug addict or whatever it is, he's leading him to think that they are a good person because they're being used and abused. Letting somebody use and abuse you is not being good to that person. And maybe that, that person who is being used and abused is a good person. But just because you're a good person doesn't mean you have to be manipulated and used and treated wrong because other people don't want the responsibility to get up and get a job and be a man and a real woman and raise their kids and the man get a job. He doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to quit partying like he's still in high school or college. He wants you to keep him up. He wants to use and abuse you and manipulate you. And Paul said to let every man bear his own burden. You know, we should bear one another's burdens to a certain extent. We need to, you know, use a little sense about when to not bear somebody's burden. Also, at the same time, the man who says, you know, he's such a good person for keeping up that that person with the drug problem or something like that. He's also implying that you aren't living right because you won't keep that person up. For example, if I t turn down giving somebody money because I know they're going to use it on pills or alcohol or something like that, they'll say, you're so hard-hearted. You, you're not being Christ-like. Think about what Jesus did for you. You didn't deserve it. But remember what Paul said in Romans 8, 13. He said, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Remember what Paul said here in this very chapter. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, he said, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. If you keep feeding their addiction, they're just going to keep reaping in wickedness, and they won't ever get out of it. You're making it too easy for them. You're just causing them to, 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 to sow more wickedness. And then they reap it. They reap their wickedness. You're making it too easy for them to just keep coasting. They're just coasting through life, doing whatever they want to do. Not only can they live the teenage dream up in their 30s and 40s, but you can keep them from reaping their wickedness until you die and then then they're just in way worse shape than they would have been if they would have gotten better shape 20 years ago. But you kept keeping them up and making the people around them feel bad for not keeping them up. Not, not only can they sleep in and not have to go to work every morning, but you make sure they have that belly full when the Bible actually says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you this week, commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Paul said that, Paul said that under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Are you more holy than God? If an able-bodied man won't work, then he shouldn't eat. That's what the Bible says. If you're telling me that I need to keep up all these people that won't work, even though they're able-bodied, then you're telling me I need to be more holy than God is. And you're going to guilt trip the man who gets up out of bed and goes to work every day because he won't supply the deadbeat with booze, and pills, and pot, and snacks for 3 a.m. munchies while he's playing Fortnite. You know, they're playing Fort. They just turn off the Fortnite when I'm getting up to go to work in the morning. When the good man is getting up to go to work at 4 a.m. to provide for his family, the deadbeat just turned off the video game system, and he's going to sleep for about 14 hours while the working man goes to work a double, possibly drives an hour to work, and an hour back, after working 12, 16 hours. But the guy working the double is the bad guy, right? The guy that's providing for his family, that's the bad guy because he's, he's not bearing somebody's burden to the point that it's doing more harm than good. Bear ye one another's burdens. Don't put up every deadbeat in town on your back. Don't just pick them up and put them all on your back. You're not helping them, you're hurting them. Every person has to come to a point where they decide to be a man. Now, people have tough breaks, and then you can help them. But most of these people, 
They're just lazy. The funny thing is, everyone wants to give to the biggest deadbeat in town and then condemn you if you don't. People that don't even give God a thought will tell you, well, you're not being cross Christ-like because you're not giving to that person. But what I will say to that is, well, I'll just start I'll just start coming around you when I'm holy enough. I'll start coming around you when I figure out how to be Christ like like you are. I'm not I'm just not holy enough to be around you yet. You know how the lost world loves to go around and say, Judge not lest you be judged and they quote the verse wrong and they take it out of context. But in all seriousness, when a person who basically only turns to God when they need a crutch when they look at a Bible believer who lives for God and they tell the Bible believer that he isn't living Christ-like because he won't be manipulated by them, it would be right and biblical for the Bible believer to say, judge not that you be not judged. Because you're, you're looking at me saying that I'm not living right for not giving that person all my money even though they're, they're going to use it on alcohol or whatever else. You're telling me I'm not living right when any other time you don't give God a thought. And Matthew 7 is talking about a person shouldn't judge hypocritically. And that's what you're doing. You're the one that I can look at you and say, judge not that you be not judged. Because take the mote out of your own eye before you want to go grabbing the ones out of mine. You see, Matthew 7 doesn't mean don't judge, period. And the master manipulator is the biggest hypocritical judge of them all. They only want to take they they only want to talk about Christians and the Bible when they can use it as a manipulation tool. Even if it was wrong for me to refuse to give to the addict, the ad, the, the drug addict, he still couldn't say, you know, you're not Christ-like for, for not giving to me. You know, that's hypocritical judgment. Before you can call me greedy and stingy and a tightwad and hard-hearted and all the other stuff you want to call me, before you do that, how about you take the moat out of your own eye? How about you drop the laziness, the slobbiness, the drugs, the booze, the meth, the self-centeredness? Why don't you drop all those things before you want to come at me and bash me for not giving you the money that I need to support my family so that you can just use it and support your drug habit? When you do that, give me a call and you can call me every name in the book and I'll say amen to it. But the thing is, if you take all those motes out of your eye, Listen, if you take all the motes out of your eye, then you can bear your own burden and you won't have to leech off of everyone else. You won't need my car because you can get your own. You won't need my hard-earned money to, to buy pills and booze because you won't need pills and booze anymore. It's a funny thing that people want to condemn, condemn you for not giving money to a low-down deadbeat in this world. They act like you're awful if you don't, even though the Bible says if a man don't work, neither should he eat. They'll condemn you for that, and yet they want to say the pastors and preachers are crooks and only want your money. Ain't that ain't that funny? When someone sees how much the pastor of an average Bible-believing church gets paid, which usually is less than your average factory worker by a lot, they accuse him of being money-hungry. That's a load of crap, because the Bible doesn't say give to the deadbeat. But it does say, in this chapter we're studying, Galatians 6.6, 6, it says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So you condemn giving to the pastor, even though the Bible says you should, here in Galatians 6.6, 6, because he's, you know, he's feeding you spiritually, he's teaching you in the word, and you're, you're against that. But you're all about giving to the deadbeat. That's a strange thing. The Bible doesn't say give to the deadbeat. It says if a man don't work, neither should he eat. The Bible does say, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That Communicate there, that means give him something. And that it just doesn't have to be money, it, you know. But you're all about bashing the pastors or the preachers and say they're money hungry. What do you call the guy with a sign on the side of the road that could easily go get a job, yet he wants your hard-earned money. Sounds like he's the most money-hungry one of them all. Whatever you do that is wrong, you will reap it in the flesh. According to Galatians 6, 7 through 8, 
And whatever you do that's right, you'll reap it in the flesh. And I'll also say this. God looks at the heart. I believe people who help people with the right heart motive, with the right heart motive behind it, will reap good things even if the person truly didn't even need help. For example, people deceive you. You can think a person needs help with food, and they go and, and spend the money on booze. Your heart was right. I believe you'll reap good things. It's not your fault they spent the money on booze. I believe you'll reap life everlasting. You'll get some rewards in heaven for doing things for others for the Lord. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't ever get weary in well-doing. Just because someone does take advantage of you, and I've had it done many times, had people take advantage of me, this doesn't mean you should stop helping people, period. I mean, I had a guy you know, borrow a hundred dollars from me. I found out he's bought a new TV with it. He told me he was doing something at the dentist with it. I've had all kinds of examples like that. You learn from experience who to really trust and who really needs help. I had to learn the hard way. I've had people borrow hundreds from me and then I go into their house and their bookshelf is full of twenty dollar Blu ray DVDs and they have nicer stuff than I have. I've had people ask me for money for a meal and they go to the steakhouse and spend $20 on a plate just for themselves. I don't even spend that much on a meal for my whole family. A lot of times people are in the situation they're in because they refuse to use their brain. Anytime they get money, they just spend every dime of it. But don't let it stop you. Don't get weary in well-doing. It can make you bitter. It can make you weary in well-doing seeing how people treat you. Especially when it comes to borrowing your money when, when they're too lazy to get out and make it their self. But Paul says in Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Notice that, especially to them who are of the household of faith. Something I've noticed is that I see a lot of Christians have more sympathy and kindness to people who are lost than they do other Christians. Now, some take it too far the other way, and they act like they're better than lost people. But, for example, I've heard Bible-believing preachers, and they're, you know, they're, they're good men, they're, they're just preaching, and they may criticize Trump in a, in a kind way. And there are Bible believers that hear it, and the Bible believers will side with Trump over that Bible-believing preacher. And they'll, they'll, they'll start jumping on that preacher and say, you can't talk about Trump like that, you know, and all this stuff. That makes no sense to me. I like Trump, you know. He's okay. I mean, he's not my favorite person in the whole world. He's he's okay for somebody that was a president. But why would you side with the world over the household of faith? Last time I checked, Trump was not a Bible believer. I mean, he's 70-something 70, 70 years old. He doesn't know which Bible is right. Paula White is his, was his spiritual advisor. I mean, he's okay. I'm not bashing him or nothing. But you'll go and criticize the Bible-believing preacher and side with Trump and the world over him. That's not being good to the household of faith. In Galatians 6.11, it says, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Paul wrote this letter with his own hand. Most of the other epistles, Paul spoke the words and had someone write it for him. For example... In Romans 16, 22, it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. So he wrote it, but Paul dictated it to him. Paul spoke the words while he wrote it down. But in Galatians, Paul wrote it with his own hand. Paul said, you know how large a letter I've written unto you. Galatians is small com compared to some of his other ones. And this has led many to believe that Paul had bad eyesight and wrote the words large so that he could see what he was writing. Galatians 6:16 6, and as many as walk according to this rule peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God this rule would be the stuff that he's been saying all throughout this chapter and the Israel of God are the the ones that the, the Israelites who actually got saved and didn't count on circumcision to save them he says, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Paul had been whipped and beat on his back and everything else. He didn't count his life dear unto himself. And he says, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. To the Galatians written from Rome.